Well, welcome to the final pallet, or panel uh, of the, the Telos Conference on Forms of, forms of War. Uh, <clears throat> and this particular topic is War as Learning Experience. And uh, since it's the last panel, all questions that have been raised and unanswered will be answered this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thus, anybody who left the conference early will have to go through life in ignorance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we will stick to the 15 minute uh, timeline. Uh, and uh, we will start with, I was told 20, I was told you 20. were told 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> actually, you did have 20 minutes because I asked for 20 minutes. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know we did privileges, right? Uh, you know. No, and, and, uh, no 20, 20 minutes is, uh, it actually is the time so, period. Okay, good. We're going to start out with Russell Berman from Stanford University. And, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is about a figure I'm guessing not, most of you haven't heard about uh, before, um, Sadiq al -Azim, and it's a different war that we've talked about, moves out of the European context a little bit. Um, and it's about an aspect of war that we really haven't talked about yet. Goal of war is victory, which means that the opponent will lose. Uh, part of the war is therefore the experience of defeat, its consequences, and the response to it by the defeated party. In the face of defeat, should one seek revenge, perpetuate the struggle, and plan for the next war? Or does one examine the causes of the failure, lay blame, and insist on consequences? Or might one just resign oneself to the defeat, do without any accusations, and repress the past? Other modalities are surely imaginable, but the inescapability of defeat as a result of war is certain, and therefore the importance of reflection on defeat or reflection on the absence of that reflection. This problem of learning from war in the aftermath of defeat leads me to the remarkable book of Sadiq al-Azam, Self-Criticism After the Defeat, first published in Arabic in 1968, translated into English in 2011 with a forward by Fuad Ajami. In the wake of the stunning defeat of the Arab militaries by the Israeli Defense Force in the Six-Day War of June 1967, Al-Azim enumerates as the causes of the outcome, in particular structural weaknesses in contemporary Arab society and culture that he claims led to the loss. Instead of bemoaning the advantages of the opponent or some unfair balance of power, he points out endemic weaknesses on the, law, on the losing side, while taking particular note of the reluctance of Arab intellectuals, political leaders, and the public at large to acknowledge their own responsibility for the defeat. Hence the urgency of a project of self-criticism that he undertakes. Hence also the broader problem. In the aftermath of any war, in the wake of the human toll, the material costs, and at the political heart of war, the diminished sovereignty, can the losing side learn lessons? Or how do we avoid asking hard questions? Al-Azim's willingness to recognize the feat as such, to refrain from sugarcoating it, and to inquire into its causes displays an exceptional intellectual honesty. That praise should not, however, be taken as an unqualified imprimatur on my part. Al-Azim builds his argument on the basis of a largely orthodox Marxism couched in the familiar vocabulary of that tradition, still widely current among intellectuals of that bygone Cold War era. And for those of you who didn't live with it, it's hard to imagine how many people really did Marxism as standard normative talk. Um, that language of Marxism, replete with descriptions of base and superstructure and other formula, moreover articulates an unqualified opposition to American foreign policy, denounced with pejorative simplicity as imperialism, and of course, an uncompromising opposition to Zionism in the state of Israel. That's what Al-Azim does. Yet even while rejecting Al-Azim's specific political judgments in 1968, his obligatory anti-Americanism and anti-Zionism, and noting the obsolescence of his Marxist terminology, one can nonetheless appreciate the lucidity of judgment and the intellectual courage in his insistence on the project announced by the title self-criticism after defeat. The fault, he insists, is in ourselves. Let us take note. And as I talk this through and I think about the paper this earlier today about the Coney, uh, it's also a kind of um, uh, process of modification, getting out of Marxism, and therefore a focus on uh, Lebensfeld and social structure. Mm -hmm. 
So this would be reason enough to pay attention to Al-Azim's reflection on defeat, particularly at this conference on war. But there's a tighter connection between that past and our intellectual uh, present uh, um, political and cultural theoretical discussions. Al-Azim participated in the Arab intellectual network that included Edward Said. Said treats Al-Azim prominently in his, Said's catalog of intellectuals who responded to 1967 in his, Said's, introduction to the novel, Days of Dust, by Halim Barakat, first published in English in 74 with Said's introduction. So while Said's famous Orientalism, 1978, continues to inform, or better, I would say, polemically misinform, academic discussions and progressive anti-imperialism today, Al-Azim published a harshly critical review in 1981, which led to a break in their relationship, a critique of Orientalism from the left. Um, so this defeat in 1967, novel 1974, uh, 1978, uh, Orientalism, 1981, the break. At stake was not so much a debate over political anti-imperialism, despite some nuances, each author flaw, uh, flaunts the obligatory political positions, but rather a profound difference in method insofar as the philosopher Al-Azim uh, accused the literary scholar Said of an unwillingness to grapple with social reality with the consequent impairment of political judgment. Now, decades later, it's worthwhile to revisit Al-Azim's writings, not only regarding the local matters of Middle East war and peace, but because they pose the question as to whether our own contemporary estimations of victory and defeat, politics and society might be similarly impaired. A few words of biography, assuming he's not common knowledge, born 1934 in Damascus to a prominent Syrian family. Al-Azim studied at the University of Beirut before earning a doctorate in 1961 from Yale in philosophy, specializing in modern European philosophy, including Kant. Kant again. Uh, <laughs> uh, he taught at the University of Damascus from 1977 to 1999, which could not have been a pleasant experience, uh, and for a while was a visiting professor at Princeton. No comment. His list of, <laughs> his list of publications is long. In addition, so, in, this, in addition to self-criticism, one should mention especially his critique of religious thought in 1969, so also early, which led to a brief imprisonment, blasphemy. He was involved in the controversy around the fatwas issued against Salman Rushdie for the novel Satanic Verses. Uh, al Azam passed away in Germany, so in exile in 2016. Self-criticism opens unexpectedly with a war that's been talked about so many times today, the Russo-Japanese War and its aftermath, the revolutions, first in 1905 and then in 1917, in order to pose the question as to whether 1967 might be followed by anything comparable. What the progressive Marxist Al-Azim could not foresee, of course, at that point, was that the collapse of Nasserite secular nationalism in the wake of the defeat paved the way for the Iranian Revolution and the Islamic Republic in 1979, a reactionary theocracy, which was exactly the opposite of what the progressive, of, of the progress the Marxist Al-Azim saw as the Arab future. What Al-Azim did see, however, was the refusal of the Arab world to internalize its own failure. Here uh, is the key point in his words, I quote, a little bit lengthy. I must indicate here a major difference between Russia and, the, and the, after the defeat of 1904 and the Arabs after the defeat of 1967. No one who has followed the state of the Arabs before and after the recent war has failed to note our vehement tendency to expend the greatest effort in order to shirk our responsibility and shift it instead onto factors outside our control, allowing us to excuse ourselves for the embarrassing situation we fell into and for our failures to live up to our obligations in regards to the paramount Arab cause, Palestine, and in regards to modern civilization in general. Although every one of us, he goes on, knows deep down that the responsibility for the defeat in the end belongs to us. We persistently attempt in what we say, think, write, and declare to save face, protect appearances, defer to emotions, and concern ourselves with proprieties, morale, flattery, and sensitivities instead of doing the necessary work 
of calling things by their names and fixing responsibilities where they belong, saying to the ones who failed, you failed, and to those who are incompetent, you are incompetent, end of the quote. At stake is, as he goes on, a systematic, quote, evasion of responsibility, end quote, and an extensive avoidance of reality in which flattery and sensitivities take precedence over, quote, the necessary work. A language of illusion serves to defer the requisite hard-nosed reckoning. Thirty years later, Azumi would name that same evasion of reality in the title of his own book, The Dream Palace of the Arabs. For Al-Azim, this reality denial is evident in the key designation of the 1967 outcome, not labeled defeat or failure, and certainly not surrender, which would have been a more accurate description of the humiliation of the Arab army that the Arab armies faced. Instead, the Israeli victory in the Six-Day War is lazily subsumed under the same term used for the 1948 war, the Nakba, the disaster or catastrophe, a nomenclature that, quote, according to Osman, contains much of the logic of exoneration and the evasion of responsibility and accountability, since whomever is struck by a disaster is not considered responsible for it or its occurrence, end quote. The mere fact of the repetition of the vocabulary presents, represents a terminological concession that despite nearly 20 years difference from 1948 to 1967, the Arab forces were not able to achieve a successful outcome. Despite two decades of preparation, their failure was even worse. More important, however, than the persistence of the term, to the, the temporal persistence of the term, it is the semantics of Nakba that is at stake the consistent refusal to view history as anything other than a natural catastrophe for which no one bears responsibility, or no one on the Arab side. Instead, Al-Azam points out the Arab propensity to blame the enemy, the Israelis, the Americans, the British, or a Jewish conspiracy. The defeated party in that existential struggle, which defines every war, blames the other side for winning, as if one can expect the enemy in a war to want to do anything except win as if pursuing victory were somehow not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Al-Azim denounces such excuses as nothing more than strategies to avoid facing the root cause of defeat, the extensive backwardness of Arab society, whether a matter of, here are some of his examples, tribalism, family structures, gender inequality, lack of civic engagement, and professional underdevelopment. One can certainly hear the Marxist thinker here attributing the military failure to backward social circumstances, but it is simultaneously an insistence that the defeated party look at itself first when it searches for an explanation of its failure. It was not only the other's power, nor was it blind faith, that led to the devastating outcome. It was instead, and above all, a matter of the vanquished's own character, beginning with a fragmented social structure that supported little civic identification. To quote again, the tribal, clan, and family ties and values that continue to dominate the mentality of the Arabs and determine the patterns of his behavior had dangerous negative effects during as well as after the war on the psychology of the ordinary Arab, on his flight from the occupied territories, and on his incoherent reactions in the face of the Israeli attack, end quote. Al-Azam con con contrasts that conservative traditionalism of the Arab, of Arab society and family structure with Israeli modernity, which in his view, give it an advantage in the conflict. Again, the Marxist is the modernist. Furthermore, for Al-Azim, the persistence of religious practices that inhibit productivity undermine the capacity of any state to mobilize strength. Hence his description, this is very timely, of a visit to Damascus where he expected a progressive ambience in what he thought of as socialist Syria, but where instead he encountered a traditionalist ethos in which, quote, the period of official work for all state employees and officials did not exceed four hours a day out of respect for the month of Ramadan and the duty of fasting. What will happen to the Israeli economy if the government decides to squander half the workday for only a week, not the whole month? End quote. This socio-cultural diagnosis is at the core of Al-Azim's explanation for the defeat and for the Arab unwillingness to engage in a critical self-examination. The backwardness corresponds furthermore to the underdevelopment of higher education in the Arab world, 
which he contrasts with the primacy that had been given to the development of Israel's Hebrew University and the Weizmann Institute. Quote again, with its oil and its hundred million citizens, the Arab nation does not contain one institute that grants a baccalaureate or licence diploma in electronics, although it knows that the MiG fighter plane is replete with electronic equipment and that all radar networks depend on such equipment. This lack of higher education more generally works against the development of critical intelligence, while in its place conspiracy thinking flourishes, especially about Jewish power. Quote, the Arabs are fond of this tale in order to explain away everything that displeases them about the strength, resoluteness, and boldness of Israel, and to exonerate themselves from their lack of effective resistance to the constant encroachments of Israel and Arab lands. We are fond of this tale, we Arabs are fond of this tale, without examining the facts and realities, end quote. Obviously, uh, Al-Azam is no friend of Israel or the West, but he does not engage in the standard tropes of anti-imperialism that vilify the West, and that of course remain familiar set pieces today in progressive American milieu. On the contrary, his point is that it is precisely that rhetoric that deflects from the necessary self-criticism that might challenge the endemic structures that guarantee defeat. At one point, he pointedly contrasts this Arab backwardness with the social transformation that he claimed, he imagined, was underway in Vietnam, allowing for a very different military outcome. 1967 in the Middle East versus the Tet Offensive in 1968. Whether Al-Azam's estimation of a revolutionary Vietnamese society holds up to scrutiny is another matter. But the point is that he seizes on the Arab defeat as an opportunity for self-critique and a call for change, rather than wallowing in self-exoneration and blaming external forces. In his 1974 introduction to Barakat's Days of Dust, itself a novel about 1967, Said signals, uh, signals distance from Al-Azam, whose prose he calls, quote, didactic, even pedantic marking the distance between the esthete and the revolutionary. That distance erupts, however, more explosively in Azam's review of Orientalism from 1981, a text which, like self-critique and days of dust, has to be seen as part of the aftermath of 1967. The argument of Orientalism is well known and needs no recapitulation here. But while Said criticizes the so-called Orientalists for essentializing the East, misrepresenting it, and therefore providing the inf intellectual infrastructure for imperialism, Al-Azam critiques Said in turn for essentializing the West, presuming a Western mentality since Homer, and misunderstanding how it is interests that generate ideas rather than the other way around. The most stinging part of Al-Azam's critique, however, is his suggestion that the Saidian logic leads to what Al-Azam calls an Orientalism in reverse that is, an essentialist account of the Islamic world as incontrovertibly superior rather than inferior to the West. The Islamic Republic was the first best example. Uh, Orientalism in reverse has since then proliferated in the idealization of non-Western societies solely on the basis of their not being Western. Hence, the Western left's infatuation with the most reactionary elements in the Muslim world and its anima animosity toward modernizing reforms. Moreover, if we think back to Al-Azim's self-criticism, his complaint that Arab intellectuals focus on adversaries rather than examining the Arab world itself fits Said's Orientalism like a glove. So in conclusion, Al-Azim, Said, and the Middle East, the topic is of interest for students of the cultural politics of the Middle East in an era since. More broadly, a philosopher between Syria and the West, Al-Azam deserves greater attention. Yet this nexus of ideas has another pertinence in the West today. Al-Azam's core argument concerning the failure to engage with defeat in 1967 has an uncanny resemblance to the American non-response to the devastating outcome of the Afghanistan war, and not only the humiliating exit. After 20 years of fighting, untold losses, enormous costs, there is barely a hearing in Congress or public demands to know who failed. 
Who was wrong? Who was incompetent? Why don't they call them the secretaries of defense, the generals? They're not there. Politics just proceed, holding no one responsible. Al-Azim's challenge would be to ask what structure in our culture generates this fundamental lack of seriousness in matters of existential importance, war, peace, and national security. He wrote about the low quality of higher education in the Arab world. The Afghanistan defeat, now compounded by an array of other security challenges, should have elicited a new Sputnik moment to mobilize education in the national interest. If we can lose to the Taliban, how will we face the People's Liberation Army? Unless we can engage in a self-critique after that defeat, why we could not win that war, we should not be surprised if we lose this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, following our, uh, our recent practice, we will entertain a few questions for Russell. All right, we have, do you have a mic? <clears throat> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Russell. It's a fascinating focal point. And it brought two things to mind. I wonder if you might comment on the, the connection. One of them was actually brought, I was thinking about, I think it was either in David's presentation or Stephen's yesterday, and that is the fact of Nasser's gamble in May of 67, having proved disastrous, and how in the wake of the war, he made his famous offer to resign, and then the, the throngs in the streets implored him not to. He then dies tragically, you know, in 1970. And in a sense, that too represents the, the death knell of uh, statist Arab nationalism. So that was one thing I wondered if, if you might reflect on. The other, and I, it's fascinating because in the light of your drawing the connection to Iran, so in also in response to the 67 war, almost the opposite um, of the of what Al Azam concludes was come to by Jalal Ali Ahmad, the uh, Iranian writer of the recently translated the Israeli Republic, and Ali Ahmad, one of the key thinkers of you know about West toxication, Occidentosis, who actually had as is recounted in the Israeli Republic, this fascinating dalliance with Israel prior to the 67 war, where he saw Israel as a potential um, thread of commonality with some kind of idealized Islamic Republic. And then after 67, completely broke with that dalliance and went into just sort of a harangue against Israel. Um, and then this ultimately becomes part of the intellectual genealogy of the revolution in 79. So I wondered if, if you would comment on either of those points of connection. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Thanks for those um, those, the, those points. With regard to uh, NASA, uh, this, this, he, he, he survives a few more years, uh, but there's enormous resistance to accepting fault. There's a little bit of purging of the, um, of the um, upper echelons in, in the army, um, uh, much more than you've seen in the United States. Uh, uh, but uh, but 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 it was the end of the primacy of secular nationalism, uh, and it would. Where is the secular nationalist Arab Republic today? Uh, uh, and it was, but it was also the end of the primacy of uh, of Egypt, which leads to a, uh, a strange distortion in the politics of the, the Middle East. It is by far the most populous Arab country, and um, up until 1967, 1970. It was regarded as the center of the Arab world, and now it's it's peripheral. It's a, it's, it's a footnote to Saudi Arabia's foreign aid, uh, and that 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 makes any discussion of um, Arab uh, politics in the Middle East, especially if one is interested somehow in a kind of democratic framing, uh, very very difficult. Uh, um, a a key piece of U.S. foreign policy in the current administration is the, the Democracy Alliance. But when, there's, when there are democracy summits, uh, most of MENA, most of Middle East and North Africa is not represented. It's Israel and Iraq, period. So from Morocco to Iran, we don't have a formula for foreign policy. Uh, whether you think we should engage in democracy promotion or not is a whole other discussion, but clearly this is, is, is insufficient. Now, um, uh, with 
up uh, up until the up until the fall of the Shah, there were there was there were there were connections between Israel and um, um, and uh, and Iran. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure exactly what what tilted him on on the on the post 1967 uh, issue, but um, that that. Um, that there was also a uh, a key transformation of the power vectors in in the region. Um, just a short, you know, bizarre anecdote. I mean, the, the Middle East is the cradle of civilization and the cradle of conspiracy theories. Uh, <laughs> uh, when when I was in um, Beirut, there was a conference. I uh, really appreciate this. Uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, regional security issues and. Um, uh, I was taken aside by a former uh, officer of the Lebanese Armed Forces, um, uh, and uh, he he pointed. So Christian, therefore very anti-Iranian, uh, Lebanese, therefore very anti-Israel, uh, and he said that he he, he, he seriously told me that the Jews and the Persians have been conspiring against Lebanon since the days of Cyrus. <laughs> yeah, what? Since the days of Cyrus. <laughs> Uh, but you know, Azam is right. I mean, there's a, a, a systematic uh, underdevelopment of critical thinking. I think that some universities are a little bit better than they were then. Uh, but I mean, that that datum, no no electronics degree, uh, in, um, is, is crazy. And this means that is that kind of cultivation of intelligence that everybody gets uh, in in university somehow. Even 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 if you're a STEM major, right? You learn how to how to think and how to, how to engage in conversation, uh, maybe even more so than the humanities. Uh, that, if you don't have that, then you have conspiracy theories. Just one more quick question, and we'll move on to the other papers. So thank you, Russell. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, coming back to the uh, theme of conspiracies, uh, Franz Fanon in The Damned of the Earth, I don't know if it's the title in English, but uh, <clears throat> mentions that uh, prior to uh, the rise of independentist movements in colonial uh, territories, uh, you see a return of magical uh, practices and rituals and uh, <clears throat> What is what are conspiracy theories, if not uh, magical thinking, in a way? And do you think there is a deeper uh, uh, psychological process at work in such uh, uh, things, or is it simply bad faith? Uh, it, in English, it's the wretched years. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, and if I know it's interesting. Uh, uh, one could. If we had more time, we could connect him to the discussion about Jung and Freud mm -hmm. earlier. He's a psych, uh, psychoanalyst. Um, uh, you could also put him in the context of figures you really shouldn't talk about anymore because it's homophobia. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, leaving that aside, uh, you know, conspiracy thinking is a fascinating topic because it uh, really is at the um, inflection point between um, between uh, between ignorance and enlightenment. And it really is an effort to explain the world. Therefore, it does have some elements of, right. of science in mm -hmm. this kind of Adornian, Adornian reading. But it's an insufficient reading. Right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 imputes, it imputes more rationality to the world than really exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, I think it does border on certain kind of um, uh, psychic disorders, uh, uh, paranoia, the... the, uh, the, the um, uh, the person who says, "I've seen that car twice pass by me. They must be. They must be. They must be following." Mm -hmm. me. Now that may happen, yeah, you know, if you're being pursued by the FBI. But more likely, you're schizophrenic. Uh, <laughs> but, so uh, I, I, I don't mean to make fun of it. I really mm -hmm. think that in conspiracy thinking, there is an effort to explain the world. The problem is that sometimes there really are conspiracies. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, in general, it's that problematic that. That we, that we intellectuals, I think, in particular, uh, are susceptible to uh, imputing excessive intentionality and rationality to the world, when in fact there's there's an enormous amount of randomness and um, mm -hmm. an accident. But the parallel, uh, if I may, <laughs> five seconds. The parallel I saw was that for Fanon, this uh, uh, arose from the fact that the imminence of revolutionary violence meant that people were uh, 
uh, ready to act, that violence was uh, uh, under the surface, but that they, there was a discrepancy between the need or the willingness to act and the capacities for action, and that this uh, expressed itself through dreams or a return to traditional shamanism or that type of stuff. And it seemed to be uh, uh, also the case here that these conspiracy theories for the, in the Arab world were a way to uh, explain away the incapacity to do something about Israel. So... It may, may, may well be, uh, that, uh, but, but that means that they are, in effect, a sign of a strategic weakness and an inability to grapple with the, um, the, the, uh, the challenges of reality. All right, thank you. We do have to, uh, right, Marcia, we do have to move on, and we can, you can ask that later. You can ask that later. Next uh, <clears throat> paper uh, is by David Pan from the University of California, Irvine, on the drama of war. Of so to say that war is a form of the drama is, in one sense, a, a banal statement. As a can't as a can't hear you. Oh, as a conflict, yes. Say this uh -huh. one. Sorry to say, you've just uh, lost a minute, David. <laughs> still, still nineteen. Left. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 to say that war has the form of a drama is in one sense a banal statement. As a conflict whose resolution is in question until the end, a war is clearly dramatic. But the dramatic form of a war um, extends beyond the basic uncertainty of its outcome and includes the circumstance that the course of a war is also, as in the development of a drama, a process in which the participants arrive at insight. To say that War is about insight that is that it is in that sense aesthetic, runs the risk of trivializing war as if it were a kind of entertainment performed, as Nietzsche would say, as a spectacle for the gods. But war would only be trivial to the extent that art is trivial. And the point, uh, but the point here is uh, not only that war is as much about truth as art uh, is, but that tr the truth of art is is as deadly serious as war. Like war, art is existential, and like art, uh, war is about truth. Art and war are linked in this way because conflict and insight are linked. This link between conflict and insight defines the aesthetic quality of war in terms of its participation in a peculiar form of truth in which the process of determining the truth is coextensive with the establishment of that truth. In what follows, I'd like to explain this idea what it means in both art and in war for the determination of truth to coincide with its establishment. I'll do this in three steps. I'll first describe the interpretive component of Carl Schmitt's thesis that sovereignty resides in the ability to decide the state of exception. Second, I will review John Dewey's idea that art is a form of experience in which conflict leads to insight. And finally, I'll bring these two ideas together in the thesis that the decision on the state of exception that would both inaugurate and end a war can only be decisive to the extent that it is also a collective insight across the opposing parties about the result of the experience of war. So let's start with Schmidt's theory of the exception. The explosive quality of Schmidt's decisionism lies in the way that it reverses the priority of law over sovereignty. Rather than seeing law as the basis and justification for sovereignty, the priority of the exception over the rule raises the sovereign as the decider on the exception to the status of the originator of law. The decision on the state of exception becomes a moment of creation ex nihilo that creates the order of law out of nothingness. Insisting, like Martin Luther on the priority of grace over law, Schmidt derives all order, including law, cultural identity, and political form from an opening decision. In doing so, Schmidt uncovers the revelatory quality of the decision as well as the conflict between competing gods and thus competing peoples that to his decisionism implies. To the extent that order emanates from decision, every such decision establishes its own world. But lest we see this decision purely as an act of violence, it is important to emphasize that the decision is not just an origin, but also a culmination. The decision is a culmination to the extent that it must establish itself through an interpretation of the past that can become defining for the collective's understanding of its identity in the present. Uh, 
The sovereign can only make a decision if the conditions are right for there to be the possibility of a, of a decision that will unify the collective around a particular interpretation of its identity. This identity in turn defines both friends and enemies to the extent that it establishes the structure for order as well as what would threaten that order. The need for the state of exception for defining order indicates that a collective self-understanding of that a collective self-understanding of its unity only comes about when a crisis forces the collective to reflect upon what unifies it and then to gather the will to assert this conceptual unity against that which threatens it. The thesis about the centrality of the decision recognizes how the establishment of order requ requires a retrospective insight that is able to interpret the past in terms of that conception of order. The decision can only establish sovereignty to the extent that it is able to form an interpretation of the past that is meaningful. In this sense, the decision on the state of exception coincides with Walter Benjamin's Jetzt, the time of the now, that links the present to a moment in the past in a way that becomes defining for both. This view of the decision as both, a, as both origin of order and culmination of an interpretive process only looks at the decision as the end point of conflict, the point at which the decision coalesces into order. But there is also, built into the theory of the decision, the possibility of indecision, or the failure of sovereignty, that Benjamin describes as the situation of the German tragic drama, in which the state of exception never ends. This possibility of an enduring state of exception indicates an ambiguity in Schmidt's pronouncement that the sovereign is the one who decides on the state of exception. The decision is both a determination that a state of exception exists and a resolution of that state of exception. Within this ambiguity between the calling out of a state of exception and the ending of it is the space of war. The inability to, to decide is in fact the sign that there is no sovereign or that there is ambiguity about sovereignty. The time of war is the time of this ambiguity, in which the parties to war are precisely fighting over the ability to declare sovereignty by defining the state of exception in a particular way and enforcing this decision as the determination uh, of order for the future. If the state of exception is the time of war, this time begins when one party begins the war by deciding that a particular state of affairs constitutes a state of exception that threatens that party's way of life. The response to this declaration of war would be an immediate surrender by the opposing party, uh, could be an immediate surrender by the opposing party, in which case the state of exception ends with the establishment of the order that is implicit in the initial decisions calling out of a state of exception. A clear example here would have been if Abraham Lincoln had responded to the attack on Fort Sumter by allowing the Confederacy to, to secede from the Union. In that case, the southern states' declaration of a state of exception would have established their own order in the Confederacy. In, the, in order for the war to continue, Lincoln had to make his own decision on the state of exception, designating the secession of the southern states as itself a state of exception requiring a Union military response. Those two opening decisions, one on each side of the conflict, created the Civil War as the extended state of exception that would only be resolved with the South's eventual defeat and surrender, allowing the Union to reestablish sovereignty by deciding the outcome of the war conceptually as a new establishment of the basis of national identity, thereby enforcing its decision on the state of exception, that is, its interpretation of the meaning of the war. This progress of war constitutes a collective uh, identity through a common experience. The essence of this experience is not any one moment, however, but the entire trajectory that begins with each side's calling out of the state of exception, passes through the struggle of war, and ends with the culmination of that struggle. While this experience is different from the point of view of the victors as compared with that of the losers, the result of the war consists in an agreement by both parties on the meaning of the war. The war does not truly end, in fact, until this agreement is reached. For both sides, the collective experience has an aesthetic quality to the extent that the result is an insight into the truth of the situation of collective identity in relation to the surrounding world. In order to explain what I mean by an aesthetic quality and the reason for focusing on this aspect of war, it would be useful to turn at this point to John Dewey's reflection uh, on art as experience. One of Dewey's key points is that art is a straining experience rather than an entity in itself. 
Instead of focusing on formally separate works of art, such as paintings or novels or symphonies, Dewey examines everyday life to identify those experiences that have in themselves an aesthetic quality to the extent that they are a, com that they are a complete experience. While only some experiences attain this completeness that has an aesthetic effect, all experiences, no matter how trivial, have the potential to achieve this effect. As examples, Dewey points to everyday occurrences in which some type of struggle with the environment leads to a culmination. Quote, there are therefore common patterns in various experiences, no matter how unlike they are to one another in the details of their subject matter. There are conditions to be met without which an experience cannot come to be. The outline of the common pattern is set by the fact that every experience is the result of interaction between a live creature and some aspect of the world in which, it, in which he lives. A man does something. He lifts, let us say, a stone. In consequence, he undergoes, suffers, something. The weight, strain, texture of the surface of the thing lifted. The properties thus undergone determine further doing. The stone is too heavy or too angular, not solid enough, or else the properties undergone show it is fit for the use for which it is intended. The process continues until a mutual adaptation of the self and the object emerges, and that particular experience comes to a close. What is true of this simple ex uh, uh, what is true of this simple instance is true as to form of every experience. The creature operating the creature operating may be a thinker in his study, and the environment with which he interacts may consist of ideas instead of a stone. But interactions of the two constitutes the total experience that is had, and the close which completes it is the institution of a felt harmony. It's the end of the quote. In these two examples, Dewey identifies a pattern of experience that gives us the sense of completion that we find in works of art. This pattern is not exclusive to works of art, though, but is common to all experiences that we perceive as complete experiences. While our lives are filled with many periods in which we do not have this sense of completion, we focus on those complete experiences as the ones that have meaning for our lives. This meaning derives from the relationship between doing and undergoing, struggle and culmination that the experience presents to us. Without this pattern of struggle alternating with culmination, our lives would have no meaning, and we measure the course of our lives through the iterations of this pattern of experience. While this pattern of struggle leading to result can constitute a continuous progress, there are clearly also setbacks in which struggle leads to a recognition of failure as the result. The key in either case is that the result of the process is an insight that forms the basis for future action. While the examples he presents here involve individual experience, he also recounts the way in which this pattern of experience that he calls aesthetic also a characteristic of collective life, noting, quote, that every culture has its own collective individuality, and, quote, Dewey describes drama as, quote, a vital reenactment of the legends and history of group life, end quote. If drama plays this important role in constructing group life, war constitutes the lived experience that in its dramatic form provides the most intense experience of the meaning of this collective identity. But because war is not simply the engagement of an individual with, with the environment, but a conflict between two parties, each of which poses an obstacle to the other, war also constitutes an experience in which the parties to the war must arrive at a culmination in which they share a common meaning, even though they are existentially opposed to each other. So in this final uh, section, I'd like to discuss how the results of war, uh, the, the result of war is a common is a common meaning and why this process is significant for our understanding of war. If the ability to make a decision on the state of exception is the prerequisite for the establishment of sovereignty, the indecision of war involves an existential conflict between two notions of order. As Schmidt notes, on each side of the conflict, the existential character of the conflict cannot be judged from the outside, but only from the subjective perspective of the party involved in the conflict. Like in the aesthetic experience in which the meaning of the experience for the individual is at stake, the judgment about the existential nature of the conflict leading to war is about how a collective subjectively understands its own identity and what would constitute an existential threat to that identity. But it is a subjective determination on both sides. Uh, because it is a subjective determination on both sides, war presents a quandary because each side is trying to establish its own notion of order on its own terms and from its own peculiar perspective. Perspective. 
The ideal combination for each party would be the subjugation of the other party and the imposition on that party of one's own conception of order. Indeed, a war often does not truly end until this happens. For example, in the American Civil War, in which, in which the South had to submit to the North's conception of order. The culminating experience of the war was an insight into the truth of equality as a basis for national identity, federal power as an overarching structure for the relationships between states, and the abolition of slavery as a condition of economic life. To the extent that the South was defeated in the war, it had to accept the practical imposition of these fundamental principles of, principles of order so that the recognition of the truth of this order coincided with the practical imposition of this order. But to the extent that the South had not fully reached an insight into the truth of those principles for their identity, the conflict continued for another century, both in terms of attitudes and in the character of institutions, until the changes in both brought about uh, during the 20th century civil rights movement. In international relations, the attainment of agreement on order is complicated by the fact that the result of war will often be the continuing sovereignty of the opposing par parties to the war, implying the continuing existence of two separate orders. In this case, the result of the war would not be the attainment of a homogeneity of sovereignty across the opposing parties to the war. Rather, the result of the war will be an agreement regarding what Schmidt calls the nomos of the earth, or the basis for relations between sovereign states. Agreement here will involve an establishment of the basic rules for regulating relationships between states, even in situations where there are continuing conflicts. Consequently, while the American Civil War eventually led to a homogeneity of the basis of order with Within the entire United States, the end of World War II resulted in the establishment of a basis for global relations that did not presume homogeneity, but only a set of ground rules for continuing conflict. The Cold War stayed cold because both parties maintained their adherence to a, a set of unwritten rules of behavior whose purpose was to prevent a hot war that could have devastating consequences. So let me conclude by noting two consequences of the subjective nature of the experience of war on each side. Because each side of the conflict arrives at a decision to go to war based on a subjective assessment of the other party's status as an existential threat, war can often not be prevented because there lacks an overarching perspective that could mediate the conflict. The subjective experience is defining in terms of the aesthetic experience of the world that the conflict represents for each party, and there is no objective perspective that could mediate the differences. Nevertheless, the underlying conceptual character of the conflict, based on subjective perspectives, also means that the resolution of the conflict that leads to war could also conceivably be carried out without an actual war. All that is necessary is the attainment of some kind of insight on each side about an outcome that would constitute a new basis for international order, a new nomos in Schmidt's terms. Because this insight is not purely conceptual, but also involves an agreement on the relative material capacities and levels of determination at each side's disposal, uh, 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 and the relationship of the, these material and spiritual capacities to each other, such an agreement of, is, of course, very difficult to achieve without the measuring of each side's capabilities against the others in an actual war. War involves insight not just into conceptual categories of order, but also the material and spiritual conditions for establishing order. Yet it should also be theoretically possible to arrive at some kind of equilibrium of understanding without an actual war. In fact, we might consider the Cold War to have been an example of a, such a situation of equilibrium, equilibrium on a limited level. In any case, we must understand war as a process of gaining insight that, cul that culminates in collective meaning. Though it is theoretically possible that such a shared understanding might be achieved without the ex actual experience of war, the aesthetic character of a human experience means that the resolution of war involves the attainment of a particular state of mind across the opposing parties that, like individual experience, can often not be attained without going through the experience of struggle itself. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to make a sovereign decision and postpone the questions uh -huh. until the end in order to give uh, Adrian sufficient time for his paper. All right. And then we will. <clears throat> well, thank you very much uh, in, indeed, Joe, um, for that. Um, so my paper is about uh, whether we are um, living in uh, a new co Cold War. And I suppose if we ask the question of 
uh, you know, whether a, a Cold War Mark II is upon us, then I think we have to ask the more fundamental question of how to conceptualize the Cold War. And I think one way to understand the first Cold, Cold War in a kind of broad historical perspective is as the third world war of the 20th century. Because you could argue that the Cold War from the end of World War II to 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed was fought indirectly by way of a number of things that we can see again today. Proxy wars, sabotage, arms race, economic warfare, and an ideological confrontation. Now, Cold as opposed to Hot War was the consequence in the post 45 era of the high cost of both conventional and certainly nuclear warfare, which prevented direct conflict among adversaries. The prospects of mutually assured destruction, uh, at least for some time, led to nuclear deterrence and you could argue mutual containment. It wasn't just us containing the Soviets and communism. Of course, they thought about that in just the same way. They wanted to prevent the spread of capitalism uh, and hence engaged in something like, if you like, counter containment. Um, now, understood in this manner, we seem to be in a new Cold War now. We have proxy wars, Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014, and of course, above all, since uh, last year's invasion, but also in places like Syria and arguably the Yemen. We have sabotage. You may remember that in 2008, China detonated one of its own satellites as a way of demonstrating its anti-satellite capability to the US. In other words, what we can do to our satellites, we can also do to yours. This was a sort of metaphorical shot across the bow. Recently, we've seen how the US has shot down a number of Chinese balloons that you know were claimed to be just there for, I think, uh, recreational purposes, but <laughs> clearly <laughs> seem to be more, just a little bit more than that. And then, of course, there's the uh, you know somewhat mysterious blowing up of Russia's Nord Stream pipelines in the Baltic seas. Okay, so proxy wars tick, sabotage tick, arms race, of course. You know, over the last few years and decades, both former Cold War superpowers have withdrawn from a number of Cold War um, treaties. Uh, the Bush administration withdrew the US from the 1972 anti ballistic missile treaty in 2002. And very recently, uh, about a month ago, uh, Putin announced that Russia was suspending. Uh, participation in the New START treaty with the US that has so far limited both sides' strategic nuclear arsenals. So arms race is back on, never mind the rearmament of uh, the Chinese Navy and uh, Army and Air Force for uh, the last uh, few decades. Then there's economic warfare. We have sanctions against Russia, Iran, North Korea, but also trade wars, embargoes, and all sorts of financial restrictions. And finally, of course, we have propaganda wars. We, in the West, we have the narrative of a global struggle between democracy and the autocratic axis led by China, uh, while Beijing and Moscow claim that they defend a peaceful multipolar order against a US-dominated uh, form of Western hegemony. But we don't only have propaganda wars between uh, various powers, we also, of course, have them within our societies, right, where advocates of domestic regimes like to brand anyone who's a critic as an apologist of the enemy and, and vice versa. So we have propaganda wars as well. So for all those reasons, you might think, why does this paper go on? We live in a new war, case closed, right? Um, certainly the case for the prosecution. Now, I think it's worth saying that the talk about a new Cold War may overstate the similarities and perhaps understate the differences between the Cold War and present day geopolitics. Because again, the Cold War Mark I was an extension of World War I and World War II. It was a great power struggle focused on ideology, communism versus capitalism, and the competition between rival economic models. We had the sort of competition between, if you like, a uh, Western, more market-led military-industrial complex and an Eastern, more state-dominated military-industrial complex. It was characterized by a relatively stable bipolarity, give or take some of the crises like the Cuban Missile one, lots and lots of non-aligned countries, and really with a focus on a divided Europe. Right? After all, Cold War I emerged from Europe's 30 years civil war, 1914 to 1945. But of course, the Cold War also did encompass other parts of the world, albeit it took a few decades for that really to become um, clearer. Yes, we had the war in Korea, but then, you know, the confrontations in Latin America and so on in Africa um, only gradually became part of that. Now, what happened after 89 was that we had a cold peace. 
a core peace among former enemies, right? So that in the end, there was never a real peace. We never really overcame the old mentalities or even the old uh, institutions. Um, rare moments of cooperation, but really um, intensifying conflicts in the Balkans and elsewhere. And neither side wanted an open conflict, but on the whole, uh, we returned to an open confrontation in 2014 with Crimea and the Donbass, which we now, of course, know has led to the present war. Today, though, I would argue that we're witnessing a new worldwide confrontation that is actually about rival conceptions of order, and also one that is characterized by the resurgence of empire, or at least some form of imperial power, together with civilizational uh, identities. So superficially, it's true, we face the opposition between a supposedly universal rules-based democratic order and a coercive autocratic order. Yet in reality, you can also see on each side uh, variants of authoritarianism and certainly variants of capitalism. So the great thing that we fought over in Cold War I, capitalism versus communism, is gone. The Chinese economy cannot possibly be described as communist, though of course the party retains all its power and influence. But we are now really debating over which form of capitalism is the more stable one. Is it the market-based one or is it the state-based one? And whilst I would never draw any moral equivalence, authoritarianism in our Western societies is clearly something we can observe and have observed for a number of decades now. So the idea that we're just democratic and the other side is just autocratic somewhat seems to be simplistic and missed the mark. Again, superficially, we have an opposition between a supposedly universal nation-state model, exemplified by the US, and then a sort of, you know, great power revanchism of Russia and China. Yet in reality, I think we're facing a contest between uh, rival versions of imperial power based on different civilizational identities. And if you don't believe me, then um, listen to this uh, that was said by uh, Karen Skinner, well known to many here, uh, when she was director of policy planning at the US State Department in May 2019. And I quote, I think we have to take the rose colored glasses off and get real about the nature of the threat. She is talking about China. This is a fight with a really different civilization. China, according to her, and I quote again, poses a unique challenge because the regime in Beijing isn't a child of Western philosophy and history, end of quote. Again, according to uh, Karen Skinner, the Cold War constituted, and I quote, a fight within the Western family, end of quote, while the, the coming conflict with China is, and I quote again, the first time that we will have, we will have, have, we will have a great power competitor that is not Caucasian, end of quote. Now, that is controversial in a number of ways and perhaps historically not quite accurate because, of course, we had a contest with Imperial Japan that wasn't a Caucasian power back in the 30s and 40s. But I think the fundamental point she makes, it seems to me, is right. The Cold War was an intra-Western conflict, if by West you don't mean just a geopolitical West, but a civilizational one. The contest with China, and of course, China trying to absorb Russia into this new orbit, is a wholly different type conflict. Hence, I wonder whether new Cold War is quite enough to conceptualize where we are. Therefore, I move on to part two, which is on empire and great power proxy wars. Now, the origins of where we are in that re complicated relationship between nation state models and imperial based models really goes back to the uh, Wilsonian moment of 1918. The battle between, if you like, old empires and new nation states. And in David uh, Reynolds' book, The Long Shadow, this is the historian uh, at Cambridge writing about the long shadow of World War I, there is this extraordinary episode he relates of uh, President Wilson arriving at the assembled court of St. James on Christmas Day 1918, no less, to celebrate the victory in World War I. But what he then said to the king and to the assembled court dressed in just a plain suit, whereas everyone else was wearing white, white tie, was, your world is over. This is now the rule of the nation state and no longer of the empire. So there was a very clear demarcation that the era of empire had ended, and this was now the era of nation states. But it's hard to maintain that America or other large nation states, China, Russia, Brazil, Indian, so on, are really just that. Yes, of course, they combine elements of modern statehood, including the idea of a nation that is at the heart of their state. 
but clearly they are much more than just nation states. And so in that sense, imperial formation never really went away, but rather, I think, mutated over time. And the reason why I think it's hard to maintain that this nation state is that all those great powers have spheres of influence. And those spheres of influence change the way that they relate to neighbors and to other countries. So it is about a certain order and influence. And those aspects of power, how you try and order the world and how you influence it, encompass three elements, geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geocultural. So geopolitical great powers try to, in the first instance, stabilize any volatile neighborhoods. Right? They're often referred to rather disparagingly as backyards. Okay, And all great powers have them. The US has it in Central and Latin America, and I don't have to retell that history. Okay, uh, China has recently done this in the East, East and South China Sea, and of course with neighboring countries like Vietnam and indeed Taiwan. Russia has done this consistently over two, three hundred years. Uh, in the wider Caucasus and Central Asia. And the EU does it in its own way in the Balkans, in North Africa, right, and so on. So that's the first thing. Nation states are never just really concerned with their own territory and people. They project power. Geoeconomically, great powers seek to secure natural resources and market outlets, whether through international trade or state-driven state -driven infrastructure investment, like the One Road, One Belt project, or indeed the extraction of natural resources at home or indeed abroad. So again, there is a contest here. This isn't just confined to national borders. And geoculturally, great powers tend to pursue civilizing missions. You may not think they're civilizing, but that is certainly what great powers tell themselves and each other. They try and spread certain ideas and institutions shaped by their own values and historical traditions. I've already uh, referenced Wilsonian idealism, right? the spread of democracy by both hard and soft power, and we can tell similar stories about other US administrations, but it's really been that kind of US idealism for a long time. The, U, the EU's projection of normative power, right? For a long time, you tried to syndicate its values in the wider European neighborhood. You know, this is about democracy and civil society and the rule of law and, you know, human rights and all the rest of it. Moscow's project for Russian world, Ruski Mir, which has been very prominent in the war with Ukraine, right? Aimed at all the countries that used to be part of the empire or the Soviet Union. And last but not least, China's neo-Confucian project of some form of harmonious development, right, emanating from the Middle Kingdom, but clearly, you know, with a global outlook. So in each case, cultural values are key to the self-definition of great powers and the way they seek to project power as part of their respective sphere of influence. And of course, those influences then overlap, there are clashes, proxy war sabotage, right, and we're back to where this paper started. But there seem to be also three different models of great power spheres of influence. One is indeed based on the idea of the nation state, right, defined by geographical boundaries and national, uh, national governance structures. But at the same time, of course, that model can have wide appeal because of the supposedly universal values that the nation embodies. So this could be either American values or British or French values, but some form of exceptionalism. So you've got the paradox of a nation state at the same time has some kind of universal uh, global mission, right? manifest destiny. The second model is based on the notion of a civilizational state. So a state that doesn't define itself merely in relation to a nation, be it the Han Chinese or the Russian nation, whatever that might mean, but rather to a whole culture, to a whole civilizational legacy. Right? And here the role of the state is not just to defend uh, and represent homeland populations, but also diaspora communities, and again, to embody a certain civilizational idea. Right? And that's true for both Russia and China. Now, I think they are not really representing civilizations, but that is the story they tell themselves and they tell the rest of the world. And then the third model, briefly, is that of some kind of multinational empire. Okay, So the Soviet Union was a multinational empire, as was Yugoslavia. The European Union is a multinational empire, quite clearly. And perhaps just because they are multinational empires rather than uh, sovereign states, those multinational empires struggle to survive. So the EU is precisely much more than a free trade area, but much less than a sovereign state, and therefore perhaps remains so internally divided and can't quite shape the international era. But I don't think it's just true for multinational empires. It's also true for countries that are sort of thought to be the next superpowers, but perhaps uh, never quite become that. So Argentina in the 19th century, India and Brazil in the 21st centuries, you know, we could call them the superpowers of the future. And they will always be the superpowers of the future. <laughs> 
So today then we're seeing really a clash between two civilizational powers, either explicitly self-defined as such or de facto representing uh, civilizations. The US and its allies representing Western civilization, China representing Chinese civilization, but of course with lots of second rank powers somewhere part of this. So Britain, France and other Western allies uh, and Moscow becoming a sort of de facto uh, vassal to, to Beijing. But I think what's also very clear is that this coming civilization contest, and that's the third and final uh, part of the paper, is not only between them, but also within each civilizational uh, block, if that's the right term. How long have I got left? Uh, five minutes. Okay, great. I can do that. So again, on the surface, uh, if we think of contemporary geopolitics as a uh, civilizational contest, uh, between essentially uh, the West and China, then I think the first thing to say is that um, we need to remember that most geopolitical contests are in the end about three things. They're about industrial attrition, who's got the more economically competitive model, linked to that, of course, uh, an industry that can basically support the military, the military complex. Secondly, the idea of some form of uh, stable political system that can essentially command legitimacy at home and project sort of strength and, and determination abroad. And then thirdly, something that actually re represents people's identity, that has some sort of sense that there are cultural values that this power embodies that more or less uh, represent either the nation or the kind of multinational empire um, of that polity. Now, I think what we see in the current context is increasingly uh, a contest, as I said, between as well as within each civilizational block. So you still have notions of the American dream, though we also know uh, how much that's in crisis. But interestingly, China uses similar language now to project that both at home and abroad. So there's, since Xi Jinping um, uh, ascendancy, this talk about the Chinese dream, and I, I quote very quickly from a speech at UNESCO, he says the Chinese people are striving to fulfill the Chinese dream, which is about prosperity of the country, rejuvenation of the nation, happiness of the people. Right? And he then links that to civilization by saying, it reflects both the ideal of the Chinese people today and our time-honored tradition to seek constant progress. In the Chinese civilization, he says, people's cultural pursuit has always been part of their life and social ideas. So the realization of the Chinese dream is a process of both material and cultural development. Okay, This is not pure Marxist-Leninism. Culture now appears as something more important. As China continues to make economic and social progress, Xi Jinping says the Chinese civilization will keep pace with the times and acquire greater vitality. And then he says, interestingly, uh, this is in 2014, as we pursue the Chinese dream, the Chinese people will encourage creative shifts and innovative developments of the Chinese civilization, keeping with the progress of the times. He says this to his elites, we need to inject new vitality into the Chinese civilization by energizing all cultural elements, and this is the key thing, that transcend time, space, and national borders, and that possess both perpetual appeal and current value. In this way, the Chinese civilization, together with the rich and colorful civilizations created by the people of the other countries, will provide mankind with the right cultural guidance and strong motivation. End of quote. So here's this idea, right? China needs to be, again, a great civilization in order to uh, survive in this contest. This is the idea sort of behind global harmony. It's really China that is peaceful and harmonious. The West has always been a bit imperial and a bit nasty. And, you know, and hence China can bring the kind of peace and stability to the country in a way that the West cannot, because in the end, the West just wants to contain us, right? The sort of all round containment that China now um, complains about. And I think we're not quite at that level because we still talk about the rules based order and, you know, the international system that we have created and thinking that China will just sort of join that. That, that dream is over. And now the question is what comes next? No one has really built. Uh, anything that the other side um, recognizes. So just to, to conclude, does that then leave us with just two options? One option seems to be the sort of offensive realism, right, which is well known, I think, to this to this room, you know, the sort of variant of realist international relations theory promoted by uh, John Mearsheim and others that holds that in an anarchic world, 
right, with no sovereign to provide law and order, states will tend to amass as much relative power as they can. And you could argue that, you know, if, since times immemorial, a great power can never be too powerful or too secure. As you know, the old saying goes, the best defense is a good offense. Or if you prefer, there's the observation by Mae West, too much of a good thing is wonderful. <laughs> so that is one option. We just have a realist contest and we'll see who's more powerful. Is it going to be the West or China? The other option, and I conclude on this, is essentially a battle over who's better at the civilizing mission. Right? Not just the power, but the civilizing mission. And here the problem is that who's going to set the terms of debate? For 200 years, it's been the West, essentially defining what is civilization and so on. Now it seems to be that the West may be out of the business of shaping history for everyone else and even for itself. And that's a quote from Christopher Coker's book on the civilizational state. So the plausible scenario is that the decisive conflicts will not only be between the West and China, but perhaps within each bloc. You know, what is Western civilization and uh, which part of Western civilization will prevail and which aspect of Chinese civilization will prevail. Now that liberal universalism has ended, a new global culture war, you might say, is pitting various uh, forces against one another. But I think what we can say is that the new pivot of uh, geopolitics is civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> the prevalent Western characteristic is the clock. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Could you keep your questions direct, please? And uh, so we can uh, accommodate as many as we can. Marcia? Yes. Where? Yes. Hello. Um, so this is a, a, a comment for Russell. Where, Russell, I welcome your comment back. And, um, and a question for Adrian. Um, I was struck in your description uh, in your paper how there are parallels to uh, the work I've been doing on populism for many decades now. That there's there's a, a duress in uh, there's a duress could be the 1967 war, or it could be the way of life, technological gender role, and economic changes since 1975 in the United States. And then there's the identification of a solution to the duress, whatever basket that is, um, in a kind of us them binary. And what you described is the outward projection rather than the internal critique that, well, it's either the, I don't know, communist global banking Jewish conspiracy or it's the state of Israel or it's the United States, right? There's an uh, against us, right? There's the identification of an us them binary to address the um, the original um, the original duress, and that can easily lead to conspiracy theories. Um, and and what what the agents are doing in both the situation you described and the situations that I've been working on is that they're trying to uh, just as you said they're trying to self educate and explain the world. They're trying to give themselves an explanation for the duress and who they are right to fight against to, to right the wrong being done. And, um, and so throughout your talk, I just kept, you know, thinking about, you know, a couple of decades worth of my own work and wondered if that made any sense to you in that structure. Mm -hmm. um, and the question I had for a um, Adrian is shorter. Um, uh, in your description, Adrian, Mr. Pabst? Yes. I'm Chris, are, you all, okay. <laughs> are you shopping for shoes online? In your description of empires or blocks or whatever, so you have, a, you have a US, you have Russia, you have China, and then you have the neighborhood. One of the things that, that I didn't hear was the question of, and Europe, the EU, um, whether the neighborhood was by consent or not. And I do believe that makes a difference uh, of whether one uh, is in the EU because one wants to be, and now Finland and Sweden want to be, and so on, and even the people who carp about being in the EU, Hungary, and so on, do not want to be swallowed up by Russia. 
right? right? Or whether you are forcefully, right, dragooned into somebody else's neighborhood. And I think that's also critical in your discussion and assessment of these new civil, new empires or new blocks. So that's my question. Russell. Yeah, Marcia, thank you. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief. I think you're, I'm in agreement. Uh, but there are two different components. One is the generation of explanatory narratives, which I judgmentally label as pathological, that they're wrong. Uh, um, and then the question of the, the causation that uh, generation of narratives, it has something to do with Lebenswelt or social structure or, or lived, lived experience. And uh, this is what Al-Azam was saying about the Arab world after 1967. Yeah. We live miserably, and that's why we come up with miserable explanations, and we're not going to get out of this until we change stuff. He was doing that in a kind of revolutionary Marxist, um, yeah. but you know, I don't hold that against him. The, the point is that th this is a structure. And now I'm saying, you know, <clears throat> folks, I mean, we, just, we just suffered this massive defeat after enormous investment, and everybody is just sticking their fingers in the air. Right? Uh, why are there no consequences? What is it about our social structure, our ratings up, that allows us to put up with this, um, with this, with this tragedy uh, uh, without you know, drama, without even shedding a tear. Well, I'll, you know, I'll with you on that. I was just seeing these yeah. applications to other um, domains yeah. where people are coming up with equally unproductive or identifying equally unproductive solutions to problems that may in fact exist. Um, but the solutions are, are unproductive all the way down the line. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marsha. So I think the question of consent versus coercion is really vital. Um, and I think there's two aspects to this. One is just the history that, yes, the West has often been joined by uh, or Western uh, policies have been joined by, by neighbors, uh, you know, voluntarily. Uh, whether it's EU accession, NATO expansion, and so on, but there have of course been many episodes of coercion as well. You know, again, we don't need to retell uh, all of that, but I think it's quite clear whether it's the US and Central Latin America or or, or Europe. You know, and and I'm afraid that element of coercion uh, persists to this day in the sense that the EU, um, you know, is quite clear that it has its rules and people have to essentially be rule takers. You know, no one from the outside who first uh, applies to join or is invited to join can change the rules. Once you're on the inside, you can try, but you are rule takers for as long as you apply. Hence, of course, Turkey's accessions don't go go anywhere because Turkey simply doesn't accept those rules. Now, why does it keep on negotiating? Because it's essentially a way of keeping a very difficult relationship somewhat going. It's also the reason why we haven't suspended Turkey from NATO, even though Turkey was actively assisting ISIS. Okay, so clearly we, you know, we act coercively uh, still, and we close not one, but two eyes when our allies, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and others don't really play by the rules that we uh, that we have written and that we don't of course always follow ourselves so libya is another good example you know was it really necessary to uh do in libya what we did and with the outcome that's not the case or in another context yes the serbian army committed atrocities in kosovo was it necessary to bomb the whole of serbia in order to stop that just from a military point of view you know so I think the, the question of consent and coercion is a very good one, but I think the West is still, uh, you know, very ambivalent about this. But, but no, 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 sure. But of course, it's the case that China's and Russia's neighbors rarely join by consent if they ever have, and most likely would rather be on the other side. Though, I think we shouldn't entirely forget that there were episodes where there was relative stability when countries were non-aligned. So you think of Finland and Austria for a long time, that actually worked because there were de facto buffer zones between the two blocks. Now, you might say that's very dangerous for the populations in question, and I don't entirely disagree. But of course, Austria was de facto under the Western umbrella, though it wasn't a member, as was Finland. But there was still the sense of neutrality. Now, I think before Russia's invasion of 2022, that could have been a model for Ukraine had there been serious security guarantees. In other words, Ukraine doesn't join. But we have security guarantees so that no invasion like the one we saw could happen. That's the thing that was missing. Otherwise, I think non-aligned status for countries in the borderlands would have actually been a realist, you know, option and potentially even a solution. 
if he wants to. Yeah. Yes. Go yeah. Ahead, please. So, but see, I feel like this is this is the the, the discussion we had last year, right? <laughs> and uh, I I feel like you haven't learned anything since last year. <laughs> 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 like we I mean, this was an adventure. <laughs> that's the title of our panel, right? Yeah. But but, 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 but what you just my page before. <laughs> <laughs> I blame you for this day, so, but what you're describing now really is basically the, the, the difference between seeing this dynamic as as a dynamic of uh, of a of a nation state system versus nation states that are rejecting a nation state system and really want to exert this kind of uh, aggressive kind of sphere of influence versus you know essentially everybody else who wants to stick with a nation state system and uh, right. Uh, preserve the sovereignty of separate nation states and their ability to choose which kind of alliances they want to enter into. So I, I just, I, I don't see the civilizational state model as anything but the kind of ideology of of, of China and Russia trying to legitimate um, their their kind of um, what uh, pan Asian claims, for instance, right? Okay, but just just to answer that, yes, I agree with you when it comes to China and Russia entirely. Where I don't agree is that I don't think the nation state model is as universal as you. You claim, not least because America isn't really uh, acting just as another nation state, right? It is a very large and powerful, in fact, the most powerful nation state of all, and hence it always projects power well beyond its borders, right? And secondly, uh, there are other countries that don't fit that model. The EU doesn't fit the model of a nation state writ large. It simply doesn't. Uh, whether whatever we think of the EU, good or bad, or you know, or, or partly good or partly bad or whatever, it is not a nation state. Even Britain, arguably, is not a nation state because it's a multinational polity. So the nation state model you think is totally universal. I don't think so, and I don't think it captures the behavior of those powers. That, that's, I think, our difference. That I don't believe quite in the idea of sovereignty in the way you do. But it's an interesting debate, because I think we're asking, what is the nature of sovereign power, both at home and abroad? And I think that's why we're having those debates. Not because I don't learn, but because I don't agree. To go back to the audience, we had very exclusive with sovereign power. We've seen we've been waiting for a long time, and by just a quick comment here before he says that, uh, we, uh, I could interject Huntington to resolve this difference there, but you would be both be appalled. So, <laughs> yes, that's true. We'd agree on that. That would be appalling. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so a lot of Schmidt gets done in this, and, uh, and David has done a usual, his usual very clear, somewhat schematic presentation. Um, but what I'd like to do, I really like the panel, I even like the order, <laughs> right, reading left to right here. Um, so two kind of things, and you've got, and Adrian and David touched on in this last thing. Um, one thing, you know, we talk about state of exception as somehow the core of sovereignty, or you do, right? And Adrian seems to be at something else, right? If state of exception is sort of inward looking somehow or downward looking, it just seems to be talking about shining, <laughs> right? You know, the, the, the light or projects outward and gets dimmer the farther away you move, perhaps. But there's a sort of spatial outward feel to the way you're thinking about political units, particularly when you move to notions of empire. And it's very hard to think about empire without thinking about glory, right? Without thinking about oh, 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 you know, what aesthetic for life and for politics that you that you project and kind of sell and proselytize for and so forth. So I just kind of think that that'd be a fun tension to play with for you, for you two. And I like to watch. The, 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 uh, so that's the form of my question. The, uh, coming to Russell, um, I, I thought this was really interesting. For, for David, knowledge seems to sort of pop out of war. We have you know, knowledge results, uh, war results in insight. And for Russell, only on really good days. Right. For, for Russell, you could lose the war and not really learn anything. And we seem to have done that in Afghanistan. Right. And and so so I'm not really sure what the status of or the relationship of what we learn. You know, do we learn in some automatic way or do we learn? Maybe. <laughs> uh, and there's also the associated words like completeness and partiality. Okay. Good. For reasons of time, we're going to uh, collect and ultimately answer as many questions as we can. So if you would 
We'll go down and collect the questions first. And pardon? Oh, yes. I would like to repeat that too. We'll keep them brief. All right. Unfortunately, all right, we don't have time for a lot of commentary. And uh, then we'll see how many we can answer. Okay. Please. Yes. So it's a question for Adrian, who is on his phone. <laughs> 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 so a very brief qu question you depicted the uh western uh, uh china uh rivalry as a civil civilizational one but uh, isn't one of uh, china's big appeal uh, for example in africa the fact that uh, commercial relations with china comes with uh no strings attached that precisely it's arguing that it's it's it is not coming with a civiliz civiliz civilizational project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next. Yes. Okay. I'm just thank you first for very insightful presentations. I have some questions. Maybe I'll ask only one. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question to Russell. Uh, in fact, I have uh, my own kind of wish for recap of this rendition of the story of Al Azam. Um, Basically, I want to make a correlation between, uh, um, in the, first of all, in the opposition, a Zuma responsibility, not a Zuma responsibility. And then I want to make a correlation between a Zuma responsibility and peace, and uh, not a Zuma responsibility and war. Basically, a Zuma responsibility is a condition for peace. And to what extent the case of Al Azam could be, could serve as some kind of support for such co correlation, if any extent? Um, if, if that makes some sense. Right. One more brief, direct question, I think, and then we'll see how it answers. Then also wanted to ask oh, Dave something. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask something to Dave uh, yes. uh, about the most uh, intense experience of drama and war. Um, could we think about something like an element of sublime? I just can't help thinking of drama as a literary term. So <laughs> if we could, <laughs> thanks. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, all right, Jay, the last one um, here. Uh, I'll ask you for Russell. Um, I was really interested to hear about uh, Al Azam, uh, Al Azam's uh, critique of uh, Said and um, uh, essentially Said excuses bad Arab character traits, cultural character traits. I'm just and sort of a broad question that you know it led me to think about Said's reception in the American academies at the foot of post-colonial studies. Um, so it's a kind of a speculative question. What, what do you think about you know maybe unfortunate American cultural characteristics that have possibly led to that reception? And you know, I guess I have in the background your observation about this um, kind of turning away from our failure in Afghanistan as a kind of an American culture. Okay. Thank you. That's a direct question. Does anyone want to start? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, um, really interesting question, Alexis. Um, so I think you're right that China's model is different from the West. The West always says, you know, it's about democracy, human rights, civil society, you know, all the kind of liberal values that, you know, the West has sort of... Um, try to spread uh, as part of trade and, and development aid and so on. But I think what happens very clearly with uh, China in Africa and other parts is uh, you are not to question Chinese power, authority. You are not to question uh, the way China does things when it brings all the workers with it and, you know, and basically behaves in a kind of totally impudent manner. So while there isn't a kind of professional values, there is a clear expectation that the recipient country will not uh, you know, will not in any way be critical and just accept de facto Chinese power. And I think that is itself a set of values, right. even if it, uh, if the promotion of those values takes a different uh, shape or form. So I don't think one could sort of call Chinese uh, relations with the rest of the world as somehow value neutral. There's no such thing, right? There's never any void. The void is always filled by something. In this case, it's, it's, it's filled by Chinese power that, you know, you're not to question. So... Yes, it isn't the Western approach, but it's definitely a normative approach, <laughs> and I think that's the that's the point. And and just to m make the argument very briefly again, yes, there are countries that look like nation states, uh, and where sovereignty is pretty much uh, on the model of both sort of Hobbes and and I suppose Carl Schmidt. But I think 
so many models differ. And I think for me, fundamentally, sovereignty tends to be pooled both within a country and internationally. And I think that's the philosophical difference I have with David. Um, I'll just answer your question about the sublime. And um, yes, I think it's essential um, because, you know, the sublime is about, well, if you take the Kantian sublime, it's about uh, subordinating um, your, you know, your, your own material interest to some, well, for him, a kind of rational ideal. Um, it doesn't actually have to be a rational ideal, I think, uh, but it's about subordinating those mat those material interests, and that's what war is about, obviously, right? I mean, it's it's your 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 subordinating your own physical existence to some some kind of some kind of cause, right? And so it's about that. And it's about your willingness to do that, and, and very often the war will come down to that 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 well, this battle of wills. I mean, this is the Clausewitzian definition right and, and that's clearly what's at stake in a war and the and, and when i'm thinking about war as a, a kind of aesthetic experience y you know the learning always happens when when there's results i mean what did we learn from afghanistan well we when we have to uh, we lost we got we we, we can't do it we, we got out right and, and, and so the, the defeat was i mean i don't know if it was a it was a good thing to learn but it was it was what we learned it was what, what we our insight essentially was that you know we can't do this right uh, and so you know, we can't do this and we need to leave. Okay. Um, the David, I mean, see, I wouldn't, I don't think that, see that as, as learning, right? I think it's ad, admitting, def not even admitting defeat. It's just, it's just running away, um, you know, properly. I don't think we should have stayed, but we could have asked 20 years, all those lives, all that money, right? Uh, all that suffering. Now, how, how come we were wrong? How come it didn't work out? And nobody's asked this question. I think there'd be an interesting sort of American studies, cultural history to do, responses to Vietnam and responses to Afghanistan. Um, McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, where's that for Afghanistan? Uh, it's not there. Silence. This is, this is bizarre. Um, the, um, uh, so, I mean, I think what some people can learn, I think Al-Azam learned, but he was complaining that he was in a minority position in a society that was engaging in a massive repression of the past. Uh, the, um, so, yeah, I think uh, resp uh, assuming responsibility is a key piece of this. Uh, I don't know the whole uh, Azam corpus well enough, but I do know that he was a Kant scholar. This is a little bit of you know a, a counterpoint to uh, Matthew De Santos' uh, anti-Kantianism of this morning. You know, part 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 of Kant could be bearing responsibility, living in an ethical world, um, um, enlightenment, uh, where there's actually uh, a further point to, um, to to pursue in that comparison is that. Um, um, uh, Al Azam is a uh, emphatic secularist in in the Muslim world, as opposed to uh, Dal Santos's um, um, what um, uh, sacred critique right, sacred. of of, um, of uh, the Kantians. And then finally, to Jay, yeah, the uh, the debate uh, Al Azam versus um, versus Said is is super interesting. Um, they were apparently friends. They broke over his review. What you can find online actually is the really nasty uh, exchange of, of uh, letters between the two. Uh, Al-Azam initially submitted the review to the journal that uh, Saeed um, edited, uh, and Saeed explains why not and promises to teach him a lesson, quote, unquote. Um, the, um, uh, but, you know, that's just nastiness between two guys. The, 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 the point is that um, the point that Al-Azam's critique of uh, Saeed poses the question to us, how come we, recipients of, or, of the book Orientalism, are so prepared to focus on the, um, the evil of Western intellectuals and are um, ethically prohibited from asking about social deficiencies in the Arab world? A critique of those social deficiencies will all, will um, is always already denounced as Western imperialism. This is a an, an, an indication of the um, profound failure, I think, of the Western left. Uh, I only say the left because that's the part of the political spectrum that engages this discussion. It probably extends beyond that. And uh, why are we so unable to 
to ask deep questions about the loss in Afghanistan or about uh, other parts of the world. I think part of the answer and part of the reason I'll conclude with this why why Said is so so popular and his 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 um inculpation of the west it's uh, it's an expression of um our american moral um um imperialism that that is since the puritans right? right we have been the worst sinners right there is no better bad sinner than we uh, and 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 we must and we and in our self denunciation perpetual we are pre- we're pursuing a kind of salvation that we can't attain before we uh, oh, please yes on the American side, they learned the, the analytic. On the German side, they were taught the dialectic. <laughs> and, 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 and just one, one, one final f- f- yes. footnote to what Russell just said. I think it's partly for that, for that reason that we have a lack of self-belief in the West. And yes. the moment you don't believe in your civilization, A, it crumbles at home, the rest of the world doesn't take it seriously, and what's the you know, that relative void filled by? more extreme versions of civilizational identity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great concluding comment by my value system. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before we, I can tell you something about Max Weber and that, but, but before we can uh, thank the panel, since this is the last session, uh, I don't know if David uh, and Adrian want to, as the conveners of the conference, want to say something generally about the, the conference. I just want to thank everybody for coming and for your excellent papers and contributions. Um, we will be collecting uh, essays for publication um, with a deadline of August 15th. Okay. Yes. And, uh, and thanks to, uh, uh, to everybody, to the staff here uh, for all of their help. And uh, to Mary, Mary's not here, uh, but to Jen, Jen is here. And now, uh, a final applause for the fine panel. There will be more TLOS conferences that we will announce in due course. So do please check the website and read the emails we send you. There will be hopefully one in the autumn and certainly another annual conference, the 20th, next year. So big anniversary annual conference coming up next next year stay to. tuned <laughs> <laughs> they never end they never end uh, we only ever adjourn them Joe. <laughs>